Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Nabil Saba from the Winship Cancer Institute at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm here to talk to you about uh, the updates on head and neck cancer that happened at ASCO 2020. Uh, this year, despite the challenges at ASCO, we have had some interesting updates in head and neck cancer. Um, the very first one uh, is the update on ECOG 3311. This is a large uh, randomized phase two study and probably the largest uh, trial looking at transoral robotic surgery in patients with HPV-related head and neck cancer. Uh, and the trial essentially um, looked at outcome for patients who were treated with post-operative uh, two different doses of radiation, either 60 gray or 50 gray, uh, in patients with pathologic intermediate risk disease, whereas patients with high risk disease were not enrolled on the randomization uh, phase of the trial and were treated with post-operative radiation and cisplatin chemotherapy, whereas patients with the very low risk essentially went on to receive no additional treatment uh, following uh, the trans robotic surgery. Uh, this trial, I think, um, is uh, probably, as we said, the largest trans robotic surgery trial, and we will stand to learn a lot from the study. Uh, the follow-up phase of the trial is still uh, fairly short. However, the main results uh, show that uh, there doesn't seem to be a difference in clinical outcome, uh, where it be survival or progression-free survival between the two arms of the uh, intermediate risk uh, category. Uh, also, uh, the low risk category and even the uh, high risk category uh, did very well in terms of overall survival. Uh, which is basically a reflection of the nature of the disease that this trial is targeting. It is HPV-related head and neck cancer, and it is uh, typically disease that is amenable to uh, trans robotic surgery. Therefore, typically it's not the uh, intermediate uh, risk clinical disease that we tend to treat with uh, radiation and chemotherapy. Uh, the main questions following this trial is what about deintensification in uh, HPV-related head and neck cancer, and what is the role of trans robotic surgery uh, in the future care of these patients and as far as standard of care for these patients. I do believe that trans robotic surgery is here to stay, uh, despite the fact that uh, we still don't have a phase three randomized the clinical trial comparing trans robotic surgery to the uh, standard uh, of care, which remains to be radiation and chemotherapy for uh, patients with HPV-related head and neck cancer. Uh, it is going to be a challenging uh, task to actually do such a randomized trial, given the fact that there has been an attempt to uh, randomize patients on a previous study, and randomization was, uh, was proven to be fairly difficult, uh, given that uh, patients may have a uh, preconceived notion or may be preferring one modality over the other. Uh, so I think uh, despite the fact that uh, this trial is positive, there will still be questions about where is its place essentially as far as uh, standard of care for patients with uh, uh, low risk HPV positive disease. Um, the other aspect of it is there is quite a substantial number of patients who basically did not uh, end up getting a true de-escalation since they ended up with needing post-operative radiation and chemotherapy. Uh, and that needs to be examined in uh, other trials uh, that are being uh, currently planned and some of them enrolling for this particular group of patients. So that is one of the uh, important um, abstracts that was uh, presented this year at ASCO. Um, a, uh, other important abstracts included uh, the Japanese trial uh, of post-operative uh, radiation and chemotherapy randomizing patients between uh, weekly cisplatin at 40 milligrams per meter squared compared to the, uh, the standard uh, 100 milligram per meter squared uh, in concurrence with radiation therapy. Those were high-risk patients, uh, uh, HPV negative uh, patients with high-risk features. Uh, and uh, this trial comes on the heels of the Tata Memorial Hospital 
uh, clinical trial, which basically enrolled a similar patient population. Um, however, the criticism of the Tata Memorial Hospital trial may have been that the dose of the cisplatin, the cumulative dose of cisplatin, uh, did not really reach the uh, desired 200 milligram per meter squared that uh, we believe is needed to achieve clinical efficacy with cisplatin uh, in that setting. Uh, and uh, what these two trials show us is that um, the uh, cumulative dose of cisplatin remains to be an important determinant of outcome. If you look at the cumulative dose of cisplatin on the Japanese trial, which basically used 40 milligrams per meter squared on the weekly uh, dose arm, uh, you can see a clear difference between the Japanese trial and the Tata Memorial Hospital trial, uh, indicating uh, that this may explain certainly the difference uh, between why we had a negative trial um, uh, in the Tata Memorial Hospital favoring the 100 milligram per meter squared uh, on every three weeks, whereas we did have a, a trial that um, basically uh, was encouraging as far as the weekly regimen, uh, even though this was a non-inferiority trial, uh, the futility bar for non-inferiority was crossed in favor of the weekly arm. And if you look at the, uh, how the weekly arm performed, it actually outperformed the every three weeks arm. So I think it is safe to say, based on this trial, that uh, a weekly cisplatin dose of 40 milligram per meter squared in the post-operative setting is now and should now be considered a standard of care for high-risk uh, patients. This is a question that we've been struggling with for quite some time in head and neck cancer. There are other uh, questions in the definitive uh, stage or definitive setting as far as what is better uh, would we uh, accept a 40 milligram per meter squared uh, weekly regimen as the uh, as the standard of care i think given the widespread use of this regimen uh, i think many will conclude from the results of the japanese trial that this uh, ought to be considered a standard however uh, you know this has not yet been answered in a a prospective randomized uh, study. Um, other very interesting abstracts uh, as well included a few abstracts that looked at immunotherapy and the question of determining the best sequencing uh, of immunotherapy, especially in the post-immunotherapy uh, failure state. Uh, we know that now, based on the Keynote 048, uh, pembrolizumab is the standard First line therapy for patients with PDL1 positive disease. Um, and we know that um, for patients with non biomarker selected disease, chemoimmunotherapy with uh, platinum 5FU and pembrolizumab is the standard of care. But uh, after failure of the first line, we still uh, don't know how to proceed with uh, subsequent therapy. Uh, so the standard of care now goes back to what we call investigator's choice uh, as far as systemic therapy. So we go back to systemic agents such as single agent cetuximab. We go back to uh, single agent uh, docetaxel. Uh, it is feasible to go back also to the extreme regimen, which was our standard of care prior to Keynote 048. And so uh, we are really right now in a conundrum trying to answer what is the best way to uh, proceed with these uh, with post uh, PD-1 failure uh, situation. Uh, I would say also that um, most of the clinical trial uh, efforts uh, are being uh, targeted uh, on the first line, or at least a lot of the efforts are currently being tried, uh, targeted at the first line, even though the highest need seems to be uh, the second line, uh, uh, the second line space. Uh, so in that respect, we've seen interesting combination trials that could, uh, could lead to applications uh, in the second line, but also could lead to, um, to moving uh, the uh, improvement and outcome to the first line as well. We've seen abstracts looking at the combination of nivolumab and cetuximab, um, and those were in the post-platinum failure, uh, encouraging responses. Uh, and it seems that patients uh, who are receiving these combinations do better uh, in case they did not receive prior EGFR inhibitors or prior immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, 
uh, indicating that perhaps this combination could be promising in the first line setting. Uh, as far as post PD-1 failure patients, um, one uh, further analysis from the Keynote 048 attempted to look at uh, the outcome of patients based on the several arms or the different arms of uh, 048 uh, and looking at patients who failed uh, and were treated with second line therapy. And uh, the trial uh, or the analysis reinforces to us that the early use of uh, PD-1 inhibitors in the treatment of recurrent metastatic disease is of uh, importance and should continue to be the standard of care, especially in biomarker positive patients. Um, the other interesting trial is the look at the TPX regimen, which was a regimen, a taxane containing regimen compared to the extreme regimen in the first line setting. And I say first line setting preceding Keynote 048 because currently the first line setting is really uh, based on the Keynote 048 data. However, uh, the TPX regimen appears to be uh, producing uh, similar results to the extreme regimen. Uh, in the first line setting. We saw that at ASCO of last year. What's interesting in this year is that when you look at subsequent therapy following failure of extreme versus TPX, it seems that if you get an immune checkpoint inhibitor following the TPX regimen, your outcome is better uh, or improved compared to the overall outcome uh, of patients who did not get immune checkpoint inhibitors following uh, failure from the TPX regimen. Uh, and that was also in favor of TPX versus extreme. And so the question uh, that, uh, that is uh, worth asking here is the sequencing of a taxane with an immune checkpoint inhibitor of value. I think many of us who treat head and neck cancer patients have observed these patients where you, know, you, you fail immune checkpoint inhibitor, you may treat them with the taxane and then they may respond later uh, or patients, uh, for example, with hyperprogression, which is a different question, I know, but hyperprogressive patients who are treated with taxanes, uh, at least in personal experience and from talking to other of my colleagues, seem to respond greatly to a taxane based regimen. So there is this, if you like, interest in, uh, uh, in, in using taxanes, I think, for patients who fail PD-1 inhibitors. And I'm saying that as an observation, not in any way as a guideline, because we obviously need clinical trials to uh, examine this question in a more detailed fashion uh, and uh, any prospective, uh, prospective uh, clinical trials. So uh, what we can uh, learn and conclude from this, um, from these abstracts at ASCO is we are hungry now for uh, designing uh, post PD-1 failure clinical trials and trying to understand the role of the cytotoxic chemotherapy uh, in the uh, treatment of these patients, the role of targeted therapies also in the treatment of these patients, including EGFR inhibitors, but also other targeted agents. Uh, along those lines, combination uh, therapies uh, also of interest uh, that are being explored uh, include a combination of tyrosine kinase inhibitors with PD-1 inhibitors. Um, I mentioned lenvatinib. Uh, there are other uh, targeted agents as well uh, in combination with PD-1 inhibitors. There is a cabozantinib trial that is currently accruing as well. Um, last but not least, I think uh, biomarker-based therapy uh, is also uh, of interest or has been of interest at this ASCO meeting. Uh, and the data on targeting HRAS with TPFARNIB really has been um, gaining momentum, I think, as a topic of interest, uh, given the generous responses to single agent TPFARNIB we have, we've observed uh, in patients, uh, you know, despite the fact that the number of patients were really small, when you look at the responses and duration of responses, it is really impressive. In my view, I think the uh, response to single agent TPFARNIB in squamous cell cancer of the head and neck uh, patients uh, 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 approached 50% response rate uh, and the duration of response approached 15 months, uh, which is fairly generous given that this population has been heavily pretreated. So we look uh, with enthusiasm to the completion 
of the phase two enrolling trial in squamous cell cancer of the head and neck. We've seen some data also on saliva gland cancer with one responder. Uh, uh, and so that could be a possible uh, area of exploration uh, even though uh, it seems the response rate in saliva gland cancer does not uh, uh, equate, if you like, or does not get close uh, as the numbers are small, of course, but uh, so far the responses in squamous cell cancer of the head and neck in HRAS uh, mutant or HRAS enriched um, tumors uh, basically appears to be fairly generous and durable. Um, we've had an interesting abstract as well, looking at uh, blood tumor mutation burden uh, from patients on the EAGLE uh, trial. We've, had, uh, uh, we've known about lung cancer trials where this biomarker has been predictive of outcome, namely overall survival, even though these trials have been negative trials. Uh, of interest is the lung cancer trial uh, also included the same combination versus chemotherapy, which is uh, Durvalumab, tremelumumab, uh, and durvalumab as single agent versus chemotherapy. And in the EAGLE trial, even though this was a negative trial, uh, the same blood tumor biomarker or blood tumor mutation burden uh, was predictive of improved overall survival in these patients. Raising interest, of course, in, uh, in using this uh, blood tumor biomarker as a way to, uh, to predict a clinical benefit to immune checkpoint inhibitors. Of course, this is uh, the first of its kind analysis. And the question is, does this hold for other, uh, for other agents? Does this hold for uh, first line versus uh, second line patients? Does it hold for combination agents better than single agents? Uh, and how can we enrich more as far as enriching the predictability of this biomarker? So a lot of things at this ASCO meeting, there's, uh, uh, more uh, studies that I have not tackled, but I think it has been a rather rich uh, ASCO uh, meeting uh, as far as uh, changing standard of care. I think this cisplatin data is fairly compelling in terms of uh, finally proving that the weekly regimen is uh, is as effective as the every three week uh, every three weeks regimen. Uh, I think E thirty three eleven, even though non standard uh, changing. Um, uh, we stand to probably learn a lot from the data collected from this study, and we look forward for long-term analysis on this trial because, as I said, the presentation at ASCO has been a uh, rather short-term uh, analysis uh, for uh, outcome, but we look forward to, look, uh, to examine the long-term survival analysis, but also the quality of life data because at the end of the day, uh, people will be deciding, I think, on... Uh, transoral robotic surgery versus, uh, versus non-surgical therapy, largely based on the uh, toxicity and quality of life data between the two regimens. And I think, uh, and I think that will be the determinant uh, for uh, future practices. Um, and that's all I have as far as this uh, brief overview of head and neck cancer at ASCO 2020. And I thank you for your attention.